Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man who popped a button on a shirt today and wants to know, does he call GQ or do they call him? <laughs> it's Dale. They better call me. I can call some damn body. <laughs> call, call Oprah. That is, get on the WW. That is pure sexiness right there, boys. Yeah, that's right. That's it. What's going on, dude? You mean pop a button like I unbutton one more or pop like it shot across the room? <laughs> Yeah, either one. <laughs> whatever works for you and whatever will get you a call from GQ. There you go. All right, I appreciate it. That's it. What's going on, dude? Oh, man. First of all, let's get a little serious here, Donnie. Uh, I just want to let you know and some of our uh, crack house friends out there know that we lost a, a member of our family this past week. Um, good friend of ours, uh, Daniel and Emily Wyatt. We're on the way back from a beach trip and uh, had a bad accident. And Emily and uh, their oldest son, Dylan, were killed in a tragic accident. Mm. And uh, we want to send our love and thoughts and prayers out to Daniel and Hunter. And uh, we want to dedicate this show to, to Emily and Dylan. Sounds good. So uh, I just wanted to get that out there, man. And uh, uh, we're thinking about you. And just everybody say a prayer for that family. Yeah, because that's some rough stuff, brother. Yep, absolutely. Ooh. Okay, that's All right, a little heavy. Can, yep, you got anything else for us, bud? <clears throat> yeah, I do. Uh, we'll go the other way right quick. I want to thank some people who uh, jumped on board the, the train and uh, liked our Facebook. They uh, followed our Instagram, and they subscribed to our YouTube channel. So they're getting some goodies. They're getting some goodies in the mail. I'll call out for uh, Dennis Mullinax, Rich Adams, Tommy Evans, Edward Mondo Bruiser Braswell Jr., and Kelly Mitchum, you guys are all be getting some cool stuff in the mail. Check your mailbox and uh, let me know when you get it. All right. Cool stuff, man. We really appreciate you and, guys. And like I said, if, uh, if you want the good stuff, do what Dale says. Yeah. That's it. All right. We're going to get into our case this week, man. All righty. I'm ready, man. All right. Uh, this one is full of twists and turns. Well, you know, we're not on a serial killer kick this week. This is uh, an unsolved murder. Yeah. And it's a, sort of a local, not really local, but it's here in our own home state of North Carolina. Right down the road. We, yeah. You know, it's a little farther. Right yeah. down the road. Yeah. Uh, Way down yonder. Town of Fayetteville, North Carolina. Right. In 1985. And like I said, this has got a lot of twists and turns. A lot of... There's a whole lot of... A whole lot of... Cops not doing their job. Mysterious things showing up and disappearing and... Whatnot. So we're going to get into this. And is this uh, David Copperfield? Is no, he, no, no, this, this, no. I'm not going to pull Doug, a, Doug Henning? I'm not going to pull a rabbit out of my hat. <laughs> All right. Okay. But this is the the murder of Debbie Wolf. Well, how do you know it's a murder? It's still it's a mystery. Well, you will decide. Well, it is put, a mystery. It is the mysterious death oh. of Debbie Wolf. Okay, I'm, we'll go with we'll that. We'll go with that. And, and then we'll... <laughs> and we will... We will let everybody else put their own uh, opinion on it when we get done. And when we get done, I want all you guys to chime in and let me know what you think. All right. All right. Sorry. Just a little bit of background on Debbie Wolf. She was born, uh, Debbie, her name is Deborah Ann Wolf, and she was born on June 19th, 1957, in Blytheville, Arkansas. But she was a nurse, and I think that's something she'd always wanted to do. And this was right at Christmas time in 1985. And December the 25th, Debbie spent the, the day celebrating Christmas with her parents, right. her family, her mom, and some of her family, and just enjoying the holidays. Yeah, it sounded like they had a good time. They'd give each other a couple gag gifts and stuff going on. It was like a you know pretty festive time. Yeah. But the next day, Debbie was required to report to work. Yeah, did she work like at the VA or something, right? Yeah, there, because uh, it's Fayetteville, <clears throat> North Carolina, and it's right near the uh, Fort Bragg. Yeah, which is one of the largest Army bases right? in, in the world, yeah. Right. She worked at the VA hospital there, and she was a nurse in charge of volunteers. Right. That's what she did, and, and she everything I read and heard, she really loved her job, and she was hardly ever out of work. She never missed was always there, just... Yeah, was even going to call. She was just going to be a few minutes late. She, she was that, yeah, she was that, that dependable. Yeah, very dependable worker. But this was on December the 26th, and uh, Debbie didn't show up for work. Nope. And Debbie's mother had called Debbie that morning to speak to her at work, and they had told her that she hadn't come in yet. Right. So that's pretty odd, her mama thought. 
she was fine yesterday and today she don't show up to work yeah so she's, so she's not one just to lay out right after debbie's mom jenny edwards she had remarried she remarried a guy named john edwards yeah she tried to call debbie's home no answer no answer no so just a few hours later debbie's mom jenny edwards her stepdad john edwards and kevin gorton he was a family friend went out to the home and debbie lived in a, a log cabin pretty cool place yeah it was off the road they said it was about 100 yards off the main road right and it had a little pond there a little and, secluded cabin and this was about seven miles outside of Fayetteville yeah. closer to Fort Bragg between Fayetteville and Fort Bragg but it was out in, out in the woods and secluded and she had some privacy and a couple dogs yeah so you used to live in a little country life yeah but they went out there and when they got there they noticed right off the bat right off the bat even not even before they got out of the, the car they noticed Debbie's car was not part where it's usually parked. Right. Which is not a big deal at first. But, yeah, it was just kind of odd that it wasn't where she usually just pulls up and parks. Yeah. It was in a different spot. Right. Now, and I don't know how far or how weird it could have been across the yard or 10 feet off. Of that, that information, I couldn't find. It's no, just I couldn't how, find it. But how it, much it's out of, out of whack. But according, I mean, everything I read, Jean, Debbie and her mother were pretty close. So she, very, yeah. Yeah, so she knew Debbie's comings and goings and and – Debbie's habits. Well, you know they're pretty close because uh, she's only missed hour, missed work for what a couple hours, and Mama's already looking. She yeah, knows something's going on. Yeah, so they're looking around, and the car they noticed, um, like I said, wasn't parked in the same place, and the driver's seat was set way far back. Right, much too much for her. Yeah, for Debbie. And they got to looking around the yard, and there were beer cans scattered around the yard. Yeah. And Debbie's not – she wasn't one for making a mess. No, and then also they said it was seemed to be a different brand than what Debbie would, would purchase. Yeah. But Debbie was, like we said, she was very neat and tidy and just kept everything so-so. Right. It wasn't – she had to be neat. But she wasn't out here slinging beer cans across the yard. Is that what you're trying to say? Ex- exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. But she loved her cabin. She loved her dogs and – and she just loved that country lifestyle, but she was very neat. Right. And they got to looking around the yard, and they didn't see anything else out of order. No, or except the dogs. The dogs were running up. But she said they usually are running up, but she noticed that they had been fed that day. And also, when Debbie's at work, she usually has the dogs chained up or tied up or something during the day. But the dogs were loose. They were running loose, yeah, and they're, they're, they had not been fed. And Debbie's mom... Her stepdad and Kevin went in the house. Yeah, and I guess they made a point to say the dogs had to be fed. Apparently, she must feed them every morning before she goes to work or something. Because every everything that I checked into, that was a big point that they made that the dogs had not been fed. So yeah, I'm say maybe they had a big big ass bowl there beside the door or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but they the dogs hadn't been fed. <laughs> right. Yeah, according to Debbie's mom. But when they got in the house, they knew they noticed things were sort of out of sorts. Yeah. Uh, things were misplaced or not where they usually are. And Debbie's mom noticed a nurse's uniform laying on the kitchen floor. On the floor, yeah. Just, Which is weird. Yeah. And she picked it up and looked at it and, you know, trying to figure out why her house is such, you know, things are out of place when she knew she knows Debbie's – you know neat and orderly like that yeah but they were looking around the house and and debbie's nowhere to be found nowhere and kevin was looking around and he found under debbie's bed her pocketbook i wonder why he's looking under there oh i thought about that i don't know i don't know maybe he thought she's hiding i don't know it's just because would you if you went in the house say if you went looking for somebody and you're looking for the house see if they were to meet anybody home would you check under the bed you know i don't know i don't know how much time elapsed and how long they were in that house they were they were looking for everything and eventually looked under the bed or if he goes straight to the bedroom and looks under the bed right i don't know it's kind of hit me strange because everything i read it's just like they're looking around and he comes out of the bedroom with the pocketbook he found under the bed yeah like bam hey y'all i found this yeah which you know it's kind of strange to me actually that her mom was at already at her house looking for her and she ain't missed but have if i have a day work of that She's already over there searching what's going on, you yeah. know, because that's, I mean, 
at this at this time Deborah was twenty eight years old. Yeah, and living there by herself. You know, so I don't know. I don't know. It yeah, just kind of hits me. I mean, a she was a weird. she was a grown woman, right? Very capable of taking care of herself. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Sorry, get sidetracked there. No, 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 that's, that's good. Some questions. That's good stuff. <laughs> but you know, things weren't right there, and, and like I said, he found the purse shoved up under the bed, right, and not in its usual location. And I guess nothing was missing out there that they could tell because I've never heard uh, him say I anything heard, about it. Hadn't heard anything on the pocket. Okay. Except they found it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've heard things too. You know, like when women. You know, they have somebody coming over or somebody coming to visit. They uh, they put the pocketbook up or they put it in the bedroom or something. Yeah. Well, that wouldn't make sense. Put it in there and shut the door or something. Yeah. But maybe it had to be somebody you really didn't trust if you want to hide it under the bed. Could be. I don't know. Maybe she just set it in the floor and slipped. Maybe that was her place. I don't know. Yep. And just a, a little bit later, Debbie's mom, Jenny, checked Debbie's answer machine. Yeah. It had a, a new message on it. It was a new message. And uh, for all you people who don't know what that is, <laughs> before cell phones. Yeah. It was a machine that had a cassette tape in it. Yep. A magnetic tape you, that recorded. <laughs> no, you have to tell what a cassette tape is. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a plastic piece of uh, material that has a magnetic tape in it on a, on a loop, and it records audio to it. Very good. Yeah. Very good. That's how it works. I mean, I'm not, I'm not scientist or anything but that's how it works me neither but i've done surgery on a bunch of them tapes oh yeah and you've used a pencil to rewind it back in right right. (laughs) exactly all right but she found on the answer machine there was a message and it was from a a volunteer that works at the hospital yes i was gonna say we assume but no we know it is and right here we've got that audio recording all right let's check it out hey deb miss you here at work today uh just wondering how you doing uh if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at day two two seven zero zero seven, or give me a call at home tonight. Uh, you've been out a lot of days. You made me worry when you miss another one. I just want to make sure you're okay. Bye. So, what do you think about that, Dale? What do you think about his uh, message? I don't know. It it uh, it comes across as a, 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 here another strange thing because uh, to me, which I already know a lot more. You know, then we're just trying to reveal here a little bit at a time. But it's like uh, somebody calls and goes, look, you've missed a lot of days of work. But actually, she's only missed, I don't know, several hours. A few hours. So. Not even a day's hour. You know, a day. Yeah. A day no, of, yeah. Just, not even half a day, I don't think. Yeah. So. And, he's, and according to his message, she'd been out several days. Right. So, to me, first thing I think, I guess because the way we think, think, uh is this is somebody trying to cover their ass, hoping nobody's noticed she's missing for a couple of days. Yeah. And then hoping, because I, I don't know if this thing was uh, time-stamped or whatever. I, we know it was blinking that morning. But, yeah, it was time-stamped. So, well, then that wouldn't matter then. If they didn't notice this till a week later, it still would say when it was recorded. When it was received, yeah. Well, maybe he didn't know that. I don't know. To me, that's just what it seemed like to me, because it's kind of odd. Why would he call Unless she's missed days before, and according to her mother, she ain't missed many days at all. And according to her work record, the hospital, she was never out. So that's just a strange, strange tape. Yeah. Or a message, rather. Yeah. Oh, and another thing about that nurse's uniform. Uh, it was also told that uh, that was a short-sleeved nurse's uniform, and the one that she had worn that, uh, that day was a long sleeve. was a long sleeve. Well, I guess it had been the day before because she didn't show up this day. Yeah, it was a long sleeve one because her co-worker said she had actually spent coffee on her sleeve. So mm-hmm. she remembered it uh, vividly being long sleeve. Yeah. So that's another weird thing. And they had that nurse's uniform checked out. Right. And the, it had been freshly washed. Right. It had never been worn. It hadn't been worn. After since it was cleaned. It, yeah, exactly. Correct. So and it was just laying on the kitchen floor. So let's just see. There's, I don't know. There's just so much weirdness here. Yeah. Okay. But... Debbie was, you know, she had a boyfriend, and she was getting kind of serious with this guy to, up to the point where they were talking about moving in with each other. Yeah, and I think they were both good with that. Yeah. yeah. And she had a couple of uh, I was, admirers at work. They were the volunteer fellas. Yeah. Yeah. And one of them was, I don't know, kind of strange what I heard and read about him. He was very pushy and wanted a relationship with her, and she 
constantly told him that you know it wouldn't be no more than friends. Right, we'll be friends, but that's it. Yeah, and Debbie, Debbie was used to dealing with guys. That was her job. You know? Well, plus she was uh, the only girl of uh, three other brothers. Correct. So she she had to deal with boys a lot, right? And harassment. So she knew how to handle herself. Yeah, and then this guy, this particular guy, he had uh, obtained her home phone number. Yeah, and had called her at work or at home. And had called her at home, so I think that kind of freaked her out a little bit, probably. Mm-hmm. And then didn't he even say he was going to come over there or something. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, he was coming over. So yeah, that would that would, that would scare anybody, right? And he's like, I think she made the the uh, comment that you don't even know where I live, and he's like, I do know. So maybe he had obtained her address too or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, or he was just bluffing. Who knows? But and there was another <clears throat> guy that had a uh, crush on Debbie. And this other guy is the one that they think left the message. Right. But they were both from the hospital, right? They were both volunteers from the hospital. Right. Yeah, that first guy said he had, like, some psychological problems anyway, so. hmm And the one that left the message uh, shortly after Debbie's death, we'll just go ahead and throw that in there, he, he left town. He left the state. He, yeah, he, he, he was gone. <laughs> And I've never heard uh, one peep of why or where he went or where he is today. Nope. And he refused to. But he was investigated. He was checked out. But nothing ever came of that. Well, he said he had an alibi, but he refused to polygraph. Yeah. And they said, okay. And he left. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, what day he had an alibi for? I don't know. Mm-hmm. What, what day, what time? <laughs> this, is, this is going into some of that shoddy police work mm-hmm. that yeah. we're going to talk about a little bit later. Sorry, Captain Jack. Yeah. All right, but yeah, it was, we're going to get into some of the terrible police work on this. Okay, after they uh, they got there and went through the house and found all this stuff and, and couldn't find her, that's when uh, Jenny contacted the police. She yep. called Sheriff's Department, right? She did, and they wouldn't come out right away. They said she had to be missing for, I think it was 72 hours. 72 hours. Yeah, before. So I think they took a report, but they weren't going to do anything about it because... She was an adult, and you got to be gone for seventy-two hours before they do anything. Back then, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's just not, it wasn't just like Debbie just to up and leave, and especially leave her dogs and not tell anybody. In her pocketbook, yeah, with everything in it. Not tell anybody or in anything. In the car, what she do? Walk. Exactly. <laughs> she took a, what beer was left and just walked down the beer and left. Yeah. <laughs> okay. After they contacted the cops, or excuse me, the sheriff's department. And uh, they said they couldn't do anything about it for 72 hours. Jenny and a bunch of their friends actually come out and searched, searched the grounds and uh, around the house. There's a pond out behind, about 50 feet behind the cabin. There was a pond. It's not a really big pond, but it's not a small pond either. But it's, it's not very deep either. It's about five and a half foot deep, I think. In certain places, in certain yeah. places, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure the whole thing. But anyway, they searched around everything, and they didn't find anything. So five days later, I think, is when finally the, the cops come in. Mm-hmm. And uh, they come out and search around and do everything. Well, Captain Jack, he just, I don't know if it was us. They got their wires crossed or or somebody took something, somebody said the wrong way. But apparently he's thinking they had already checked the pond. So they figured it wasn't no use for them to check the pond. They weren't going to put no divers or they weren't going to drag the pond or anything like that. They searched the cabin. Later that afternoon, they brought the bloodhounds out, which they could find nothing at all. They then walked around the edge of the pond. I was there for that. And they looked across it. Granted, it's a small pond, but it's deep in some places, and it's not that small. I asked if they were going to put a a boat into the water and at least paddle across it. Uh, They said they didn't know it was getting too late and that they would let me know the next day. Of course, some of the individuals there that had, uh, that were friends of the family had been there a couple of days prior, had done some searching on their own. And uh, I think it was mentioned that they had already looked in the pond. That was no use for us to look in the pond. So I don't think we did a dive of the pond or a complete search of the pond on that day. No, we did not. At that time, I asked him if it would be all right then if I got my own divers to go into the pond. And he said, certainly. Yeah, the police had thought the family had already had somebody check the pond. Yeah. Yeah. According to Captain Jack. Yeah. 
So then, so what she asked then uh, after that was, if you're not going to check it, then can I hire my own people to come in and check it? So that right there kind of contradicts what he says. Mm-hmm. But he said, sure, it's no problem. So she talked to Kevin Gorman and his friend Gordon Childers, who was uh, he was from the Army base, wasn't he? Yeah, the Gordon Childress. Yeah. He was a paratrooper at Fort Bragg. And he had some uh, rescue experience as far as... Uh, Diving and... I mean, he had a lot of experience and all that stuff. Right. So he said, sure, he would come in and check it out. So he brought his uh, diving equipment out, and then they set out to search the pond. So uh, he went in and uh, went out it's probably about 30 feet. He said he was probably in the water about two minutes. Less than two minutes. And he noticed, Dale, that uh, some footprints and drag marks on the bottom of the... In the muck. In the, yeah, in the muck. You know, how you, you know how you walk into a river or lake or something, you get into the, the silt and the... Muck. Muck. <laughs> and, yeah, he noticed yeah some drag marks yeah, and so the he, ground had been disturbed. So he popped up right away and said that he had located that and he was going to follow it. Yeah. So he, then he went back down and started following the footprints and he said he was going along the bottom just just a few inches along the bottom of the of the lake and when he his face mask happened to hit something in the water yep and it was a, a foot right sticking out of a uh barrel a, like a like a metal drum so this means maybe that the barrel was turned over sideways could have been that or just you know, or just Laying there wedged on something, or right. you know, not standing straight up, yeah, but like, yeah, sort of laying down because if you run into it, if he was within a foot from the ground, you know, you would think he'd have mm. to be laid over sideways, yeah, okay, yeah. And so then he come up and he told uh Kevin that he found something that looked like a human body, yeah, and he, was, he was going back down, right? And they told him to go double check, they went back down and said it definitely was, and it was in a barrel, a burn barrel, yeah, that's exactly what he called it, and uh, it was. He said it was rusted and it had holes in it. Right. Looks like a body down here. Are you sure? Let me double check. So I went back down, confirmed the hole, spent more time looking, and didn't touch or disturb anything. I couldn't see above midrift because it was inside of a, it looked like a burn barrel. It was a rusty 55 gallon oil drum type thing with holes in it. Like basically, like a it's a fifty five gallon drum made out of metal, and it was rusty, had holes in it. You know, some people burn wood, some people burn trash, some people just shoot them. But that's what it was: fifty five gallon metal or steel or whatever it was it was a rusted fifty five gallon drum with a body in it. Yep, exactly. So he didn't touch anything, and didn't touch anything, didn't disturb anything. Come back out, and they called the sheriff's department. Yep, and they came out. Yep, and brought their divers. Yeah, and they went down and. Uh, Recovered Debbie's body. Just the body. Just the body. No barrel. Yeah, which is, I don't know, I guess I'm thinking in today's police work, why in the hell they don't bring them both out at the same time and not disturb all that evidence. Check check that whole bottom, anything we found. Yeah, anything near there. Bring everything out. And so they brought her out, and then they had somebody identify the body, and it indeed was Deborah Wolf. It was the Kevin Gorton, the family friend that identified Debbie, and he said... The way she looked, she just looked like she was asleep. Right. Um, her eyes were closed. Her mouth was closed. She looked very relaxed. Yeah, not like a drowning victim at all. Mm. Because they said if you basically if you drown and then you're usually your eyes are open and your mouth's open and your hands and arms are basically in a clawing position because you're fighting for your life. Yeah. But she looked like she was asleep, which was really odd to him. Yeah. Which is crazy too, because you know. I don't know if it was determined how long Debbie was in that water, but, you know, later at her funeral, uh, she had an open casket right. funeral. So, it damn sure wasn't long as she was missing. No, uh-uh. She hadn't, she hadn't been it, in that water long. No, because they said she was, the body was extraordinarily clean. Yeah. Because it said even the two divers, it took them several days, I think three days. Three I think days. Said, to get all the silt and stuff cleaned out of the diving equipment. And then said that, you know, even the white tennis shoes that she had on were still fairly clean. Yeah. So, so she hadn't been in that water long. No. And uh, also, Dale, Debbie's body was found 30 feet from the bank in five and a half feet of water. Right. And this was on New Year's Day, 1986. Yep. Yep. January the 1st. New Year's Day. All right. Now, Dale, on January the 2nd of 1986, 
Uh, Debbie Wolf's body was given an autopsy by Dr. William Oliver, and he worked for the North Carolina Medical Examiner's Office. And the manner of death was reported as undetermined. And the, the medical examiner could not find, you know, or couldn't determine if it had been drowning or not, or hom- or homicide. Right. He well, couldn't find anything. Well, there wasn't no, no cuts, no bullet holes, no nothing like that, so it was not really easy to figure it out. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We talked about this off at, off the air earlier about investigations done around the cabin, if, you know, fingerprints taken, anything like that. Right. It, the beer cans, the car, the cabin. I have never heard of anything, of any fingerprints being taken around that house. No, nothing. Not the first word because that, that really bugged me because I'm like, they they really, really put out the fact that the cans were in the yard. They really put out the fact that the car was in the wrong place with the seat pushed way back. Everything's misplaced. Stuff in the house is rearranged, but not one fingerprint has ever been taken, as far as I can find. Out. No, I haven't heard. And this this was 1986. Yeah, and you know, hell, Richard Ramirez got caught because of fingerprints. So I know they're doing fingerprints, and that was 1985. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, they've been doing fingerprints since way back when. Yep. But I don't know about how strong the DNA stuff was at the time. But they didn't even keep any of the cans. Or anything, Mm-mm. which is really weird to me. I mean, this whole, it's a really shoddy investigation is what it is. You know, and, and Dale, findings from the autopsy should have raised some uh, red flags about Debbie's death. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, everything is pointing to somebody has done something. Foul play has been, I she, mean, everything is weird. Nope. She had multiple abrasions on several of her fingers, which could have been defensive wounds. Could have, yeah. Yeah. And it is reasonably... You know, to conclude that, you know, in a typical drowning situation, you know, their eye, like we said, their eyes and mouth would be opened, mm-hmm. but none of that. None of it. It was just weird. Yep. Like she was just relaxed in that barrel. And also, you know, when somebody's drowned, they typically have like a white froth foam yeah. around their mouth. And there was none of that. No. Nothing. And in her air, or actually in her upper airway, they found a half a teaspoon of water. Half. Half a teaspoon, <laughs> which is not a lot of water. No, it was their upper bronchial area. Yeah, so it couldn't have been drowning. Right. No. Now, Donnie, meanwhile, while we're going on with his autopsy on the next day, when they took her body out of that pond. Yes, sir. And they brought her out and put her on that stretcher, and they had somebody come and identify her. Her mother come out of the cabin and asked, are you going to get the barrel? And what yeah. they tell her? <laughs> We're coming back to get it tomorrow. We're coming back tomorrow. It's getting a little late. We're going to come get it tomorrow. And she yeah. thought that was odd. Yes. Yeah. Well, they the authorities told her that they were coming back the next day to get the barrel. Right. After the body was retrieved and dispatched to a local hospital, uh, I walked away from the pond up to the cabin. As I was walking away, they were discussing how to mark the barrel and how to bring it out then. Um, I thought surely they would do that. I walked back out of the cabin about 10 minutes later and saw all their cars leaving. And I asked uh, one of our friends who were there, I said, what happened? Do they have the barrel? And they said, no, they decided to leave it there. And the next day, what happened? The cops showed up and there was no barrel in the lake and the cop said there yeah. was never a barrel there was no barrel they changed their they changed their story yeah said what you saw was that army coat she had on billowing out or ballooning up however he phrased it it looked like a barrel yeah debbie at the time was wearing a a green field jacket yeah field jacket and it it had ballooned out it's what the cops were saying that made it appear captain jack yeah that made it look like a barrel. Yes. So, I guess you've got a barrel hanging over here on the wall, don't you? <laughs> yeah. When you've got a, a U.S. Army paratrooper professional diver going down looking and seeing a barrel barrel with bullet holes in it. Right. Family friend Kevin saw the barrel. Yes. So, at least two people saw the barrel. But now, the next day, there is no barrel. No barrel. So, what the hell? 
Yeah, so this this is one of the. It just keeps getting uh, weird. Is this Tiger King? Tiger King investigations. It, could it just be. keeps getting weirder, man. Yeah, absolutely. So this is really intriguing, man. So now, now we got a, a mystery on our hands. Where is the barrel? Is there a barrel? Was there even a barrel? Well, there was a barrel because Debbie's mom, Jenny, said that. Debbie had a barrel out there beside her house, and they used that barrel for target practice when they were shooting pistols. So, it, therefore, it would be full of holes, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Right. And the uh, indention in the ground, a circular indention, was there yep. where the barrel was. When she thought of it, she's like, man, there's a barrel over here. And she walked over there. You know what was there? Just a hole in the ground where, where the, the weight of the barrel pushed into the ground, the ring. There was no barrel, but there was a ring and evidence where there once was a barrel. Yeah. So that was, where's that barrel? That was in the lake. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's what gets me, Dale, because, you know, they said they were they were coming back the next day to get the barrel. Right. Okay. Now, when they got back, there was no barrel. Who would be dumb enough or risk enough to go back and, and take the barrel? Pull that barrel out of the water. A heavy barrel that's 30 feet from the bank. That just that blows my mind. Yeah, mine too. I don't get it at all. Unless, it's, well, I was going to say, it just sounds more like maybe the cops were involved or something. You know what I mean? Or, or, who would even know that they didn't take the barrel? Or were they protecting somebody? True. Could they have been protecting somebody? I guess it's possible. Yeah. Because, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I guess it's possible. Very possible. I don't know. This whole damn thing is just. That's why I wanted to do this this episode because it's it's a North Carolina story. This lady is, deserves some justice, but this this it just frustrates me. <laughs> All right, Dale. We're going. We got some more frustration here. A couple months later, after Debbie's death. Debbie's mom, Jenny, receives a box from the medical examiner's office. And they had the clothing that Debbie was wearing the day they found her. Okay. Okay. And Jenny examined the clothing that her daughter had on when her body was pulled from the pond. And it just didn't add up. And just to go through this, there were brown corduroy pants that were too big and too long. Yeah. Just uh, way too long for Debbie. Yeah, way too long. And the bra cup size was, was three sizes too large, and round size was two sizes too large. Right. Well, Debbie was found wearing a size 38C, and she wore a 34B. And that just that didn't add up with Jeannie at all. Right, and this is all according to her mama, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Nike shoes were three sizes too large and were men's shoes and she was wearing she was found wearing a men's size six but debbie wore a ladies size seven hmm. so that ain't weird at all no huh? <laughs> huh and when debbie was found she had on a new regulation army field jacket that didn't belong to debbie at all right so or, did, she did have one that was her brother's but it, it had his name on it. this one had no name tag at all yeah and, and it wasn't even associated with her she right there's no way to trace it no name or nothing mm-hmm. so and debbie was found wearing a black t-shirt with the pittsburgh steeler logo on the front now, who in the hell would wear that oh, yeah really <laughs> but um <laughs> debbie's mom her boyfriend or anyone couldn't uh, couldn't identify the shirt Right. And claiming I have no idea where it came from, didn't even know that if Debbie owned a Pittsburgh Steelers t shirt. So everything she had on, apparently, according to her mother's, was not hers. Exactly. I guess she didn't have no drawers on. You don't say nothing about that. They don't say no drawers at all. Yeah, Dale, um, the clues kept adding up that pointed to murder, but they were ignored by the county police. It's just weird, isn't it, man? Yeah. And a family friend, his name was Franz Schohoff. Whoa. Yeah. Franz. Said, Franz. And I'm here to pump you up. He had gone to the cabin to feed <laughs> Debbie's dogs and found Debbie's wool stocking cap in the mud on the opposite end of the pond from the location where she was thought to have entered the water. Now, would that be a, a toboggan from uh, North Carolina's standards? Yeah. Okay. 
and a knit hat if you live in Wisconsin. Shout out to I you. guess if your name Franz, <laughs> you call it a wool stocking cap. Yeah. And the family thought it was odd because it was a thin layer of ice on the pond. It was unlikely that the cap could have floated to the other side of the pond. Right, because it was found on the opposite side from where she was found. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, I don't think it would float across. I don't think it would float either at all. Yeah, it would just... Well, it might float, but it, it's not going to wash up on the shore. You'd, be, you'd think it'd eventually get waterlogged and just... Yeah, because it wouldn't wash up on the shore. Mm-mm. It's not the ocean, it's a pond. No. Okay. And Debbie's mom also found it odd that when the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, which is the SBI, yeah. returned the white Nike tennis shoes to her, they had no mud on them. And they insisted that they had not washed or cleaned those shoes. Nothing. Exactly how they came off the body. And these divers that went down, like we said, had to wash their gear. Muck. Three days to get the silt out of it. And the muck. And the muck. You say that again. Muck. Yeah. <laughs> now, Dale, detectives would later claim that they investigated several patients with mental problems at the VA hospital, including the man who left the voicemail message. Yeah, uh, I think... Uh they said that actually they had talked to everyone that the family wanted them to talk to. Yeah. Or try. Mm-hmm. What the hell is that? They just, <laughs> do you need to be told by the family who to investigate? Mm-hmm. Oh, Lordy. And like we said, soon after being interviewed by the detectives, the man who left the voicemail left the state of North Carolina. Right. Well, see, there's a saying in the realm of criminal investigation that goes something... You know, like this, a dead body cannot speak from the grave. It seems that Debbie Ann Wolf is just doing that. She's trying. Yes, she's trying. Nobody's listening, especially mm-hmm. the police. All right. You want to get into some theories and different things about the investigation? Now, Debbie's mother, she really worked worked hard to try to solve this murder. Even for 20 years, she's tried to solve it. Yeah. And eventually, she passed away. Mm-hmm. And so, that's when, after she passed away, and uh, all Deborah's brothers had passed away. Actually, one had passed away before she did. So, everybody with, who was fighting for her is pretty much passed. So, that's when uh, Dr. Maurice Godwin, he took up the fight. And then, he later discovered uh, some information from the case file suggesting that semen was present in the victim. Now, we don't know if she was raped or, or whatever, and basically DNA profiling was, wasn't available back then, but but it's still some vital evidence. Mm-hmm. And it makes you wonder if even the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department even has the vaginal swab at all anymore. Right. That's what I was wondering. I mm-hmm. mean, hell, if he'd have kept that and them cans and some fingerprinting and done something, they might could figure it out today. Exactly. I think that, that case could have been solved yeah, back then. It's it's just so... So much weird, random craziness. I just don't... It just blows my mind. It blows my mind. But this case is still unsolved today. Yeah. So, now, what's the theory? Uh, Start with Captain Jack. What's he think of? He thinks it was a drowning. Yeah. He thinks she drowned, and she was playing with the dogs, and got into the water, and got into the cold water and panicked and drowned and trip fell in a barrel yeah oh wait he said there's no barrel exactly but okay so let's go back to that day that was on uh december the 26th give or take that and was the day she she missed was, work. went went missing right yes. so he thinks she went out to play with the dogs going around the pond where she lived and fell in. Yep. Now it was the high that day was twenty nine degrees, mm. which is not too terrible for her. And the low was ten, so we'll go in the middle there somewhere. So I don't think she's going to be out playing around the pond. She knows she even if she did, she was an avid swimmer. But I don't think you know, and that's where that immersion what was syndrome, called? immersion syndrome, come in. Like they said, that if she didn't drown, then maybe she, that would give you like a heart attack or something similar mm-hmm. to that. But the autopsy said none of that was there was no symptoms of any of that mm-hmm. so that theory is pretty much trash if you ask me I, I don't think that happened i don't think she's out playing with the dogs and fell in the water and landing in the barrel no she was probably outside with the dogs but she it wasn't long maybe i'll let them go to the, do their business and then come back in or something right, or, yeah yeah and so I, i'm not buying that one at all Mm-mm. 
So what else? What did he? There was another one. I guess the immersion syndrome. But there's not enough water for a drowning period. No, the half a teaspoon, right? And it was in, and it was actually up in in her upper airway. Uh, right. There was nothing in the lungs. Okay, and the body still looked fairly. I don't want to say new, but really good condition to supposedly be in the water that would do some finger quakes supposedly be in the water that long Mm -hmm. so so i I don't i don't buy this accidental drowning at all no i don't either i think debbie was murdered and possibly murdered by somebody from the hospital yeah me too and possibly by the one that made the phone call but that is so damn fishy about that voicemail yeah now they said he had an alibi but alibi for when it yeah. could have been anywhere between December 25th after she left her mother's house till hell a week later when the cops decided to get in the fight. Exactly. So we don't know. And it looks to me like, say, there's an old adage where, you know, you hide, hide stuff where they already looked because they're not going to go back, you know. So mm-hmm. maybe they something happened. Who knows what happened? We don't know. All we know is, you know, she's dead and in the water at this one point when they find her. But before then... Even uh, it could have been a kidnapping, could have been whatever. But I don't think she was around there. I think they had taken her somewhere else. Yeah, and brought her back to the house. And, and then once they knew that they would search the house and search the lands, and then took her to there and put her in the water. Yeah. Now, why in the hell they put her in the barrel? I don't know. Maybe they thought that would hide her if they put her in the barrel. And, but still, you know. I don't, Hold her body underwater. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's layered down sideways, keep her from coming right back up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was out 30 feet, so it wasn't terrible too far to go out in the water. I know it was cold, but that would make more sense to me than that. And then just with the persistence of her mama, you know, that they went right back to there and looked. Mm-hmm. So the old hide them where they already looked didn't work this time, but I think it's something like that. Now, I don't know how you explain all the clothes that ain't hers unless they had her somewhere else, and then uh, maybe they cut all her stuff off and then just gave her whatever was available at the wherever they had her yeah and then i don't know how she was killed but uh, she definitely wasn't drowned uh-uh. I, think, I think if you find the person that drunk that beer that brand of beer was in the beer cans they found in the yard and i think you'll find out who killed debbie now they'd never said that you know even i was curious to, to like the size and the heights of the guys they talked to you know, and uh, we watched uh, this. This was even featured on uh, Unsolved Mysteries, and I don't know how accurate the actors they have re- uh, what do you call it uh, recreation. Re- yeah, recreating all this stuff. How accurate that is, but the one guy they really made a point to show that the one guy that they thought did it was huge. Yeah, and does that say they're thinking the same thing? Is he's the one driving the car? Is that why the seat was pushed back so far? Could have been. See, and the other guy that was talking to her was pretty small. Yeah. So I, I kind of noticed that. I don't know if he was paying attention or I paid thought attention. about it. But but it was kind of weird, you know, and, because they didn't say what the actual person, what where their height and weight were. But they sure portrayed them as, as that on yeah. the recreation. Yeah. So that was weird. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It just it just seems like they didn't even try. I know. They didn't, they didn't try. And why, why would you let the guy just leave the state? Exactly. He had an alibi, didn't, and he refused the polygraph, and then, and then he left. Yeah, he would have been prime suspect number one. Yeah, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And then just, it's been all these years, and they don't know any more today than they did, hell, really, the week after they found her. Exactly. They don't know anything. It's, it's really sad. For and all of Debbie's family is dead and gone. Yep. Nobody's around to take up her fight. Nope. Nobody but uh, Dr. Maurice Gordon. And a or few. Godwin, excuse me. Yep. And people doing podcasts about her. Yeah. I'm trying to help her out. And So that's kind of what we think about it. What do you guys think? I mean, how in the heck does this happen? I, I don't understand it. If anybody has a theory on this, you know, weigh in, let us know. Email us at our email account, uh, crackhousechronicles at, at gmail.com. You can leave us a comment on our Facebook page, on Instagram. Yeah, anywhere. Yep, and weigh in on it. Give us your thoughts. Maybe we need to 
have a forum page. That maybe maybe everybody can get chat back and forth. That'd be cool. Yeah, maybe we could set up a forum page. That'd be sweet. Yep. But uh, yeah, we'd really like to know what you guys think because uh, when I first heard of this story and started looking into it, it really drew me in. And then the more I found out, the matter I got because it's like they, these people didn't, they really let this girl down. They really did. Yeah. And uh, But that's basically the story of Deborah Wolf. All right. Say it in. Yep. All right, Dale. We're going to get out of here. All right, man. Sounds good. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The The Crack Crack House House Chronicles. Chronicles.